Well, good morning. Welcome to Gospel City Church once again. So glad that you are in the house of the Lord today, and it's an honor to exalt Jesus Christ with you. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Hopefully you brought a Bible, and you can open that to Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Genesis chapter 2, and we are venturing into the second chapter of the first book of the Bible and the message that God's inerrant and holy word would have me preach to you today, I've entitled The Seventh Day God Rests. The Seventh Day God Rests. And so we're going to look at verses one through three of chapter two. And the big idea that I'll give to you that we'll kind of spend our time on is this true rest is found in God's finished work. True rest is found. In God's finished work. And before we do any diving, let's just hear from the word of God this morning. I am reminded once again what a momentous moment it is to gather together and read the word of God. And so even as we look at these three verses, understand the gift that has been given to us in God's holy word. Why don't you get your eyes on a copy of Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 and we'll pray together once again. Now hear the word of the Lord. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Let's pray together. Father, um, very aware that you are present and that you are here and that you desire to move right now in this 1030 service on Sunday morning. And so, Lord, I had the privilege of worshiping you in the 830 service, but Lord, I pray that you do something new right now. I pray that your spirit would move among us right now. I pray that you would enlighten and illuminate our hearts and our eyes to the truth of your word right now. Lord, I thank you for every individual that came to this unique and specific service on this day. Lord, I pray that their hearts would encounter Jesus today. Lord, I pray that we would encounter Jesus together today as we look to your holy word. I thank you for That great hymn that we just sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I thank you for the verses that were chosen. And we see through those verses that our salvation is is nothing of our own doing. (laughs) But it is solely up to you, a sovereign and merciful God who extends grace to us regardless of the merit that we bring to the table. And Lord, it causes us to stand in awe. It causes us to sit back and say, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. So, Lord, even as we sit here in awe, pardoned for sin and shame, we have found peace that will endureth in the person of Jesus Christ. My mind was also drawn this morning to uh, a brother that we've been praying for as elders and pastors who is spreading the name and the fame of Jesus in another country that has not heard the name of Jesus. And it was brought to our attention over the last couple of weeks that he was arrested for preaching the gospel and separated from his daughters and put in a prison. And upon seeing him a few weeks later, they realized he was crying and hadn't been fed, and yet he had not given up his testimony of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we've been praying, I've just can't get out of my mind that there are billions of people who have not heard the name of Jesus. And there are people out there who have caught the fire that only comes from the grace of God within them. And they are doing all that they can. I thank you for this gentleman who is in prison and has not given up his testimony, but continues to tell others of the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would encourage him. I pray that you would uh, fan his flame. I pray that you would give him endurance to stand up under the pressures that he is facing right now, wherever he may be. And Lord, I think of so many other missionaries, those in the missions field, those who are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the nations. Lord, would you encourage them today? 
Would you encourage Billy and Jen Nelson with ARA and some of our other friends in Hungary and Belize and Liberia and uh, other places in the world? And Lord, would they know that you are the sovereign God and would you meet with them as intimately and as intricately as you want to with us today? Help us not to take for granted the opportunity that we have to freely sit shoulder to shoulder with those that you are calling into the body of Christ and open your word. Help us to not take for granted the opportunity that we have to, to pray freely, to sing freely the power of the gospel. And because of that freedom... Help us not to grow stagnant. Lord, help us to continually be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Transform us into the likeness of Christ, even here this morning. And so, God, I just pause and I pray because I, we're desperate for you and we're in need of you. And we have nothing without you. So, Holy Spirit, would you move and would you work? Would you take every care and every idol? Would you take every burden and every circumstance and every trial, would you set them aside for a moment so that we could gaze into your glory, gaze into your majesty and see you on the pages of scripture that you would have us look at today. Holy Spirit, come and speak. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, and uh, thanks for pausing with me and just thankful for this opportunity that we have. And as we look at Genesis chapter two, verses one through three, and God's rest on the seventh day, there's a lot of places that I wanted to go with this topic of rest. And I'm sure that if you are a Christian and you listen to podcasts and read books, you've read a book about Sabbath rest. There's been a lot of them. It's kind of been a buzzword throughout uh, the last couple of years in our society. And there's lots of helpful books about, you know, how to slow down in this hustle and bustle world in America that we live in and, and the healthy habits of resting and, and sharpening our saw one day a week so that it's sharpened for the rest of the week. And there's so many places that you could go. But the, the challenge I, I wanted to, to lean into is that we draw out of scripture what's meant to be drawn out. I was reminded of uh, Charles Simeon, who was a, a preacher in the 1700s, 1800s. And I, I saw, I posted a, a, a quote about two years ago, and it popped up on my Facebook feed yesterday, reminding me and the thing about Charles Simeon, he was a great expositor of God's word. He opened the Bible and he took out of scripture what was meant to be. And the quote that I had posted was, we must never lose the conviction to remember what constrained Charles Simeon in the study, and that is to pull out of scripture what is there. And so... I say that because it's easy for me to jump to all kinds of topical sorts of things regarding Sabbath rest and your busy life, but I think we'll be able to apply this, but let's just see what God was doing on day seven of creation as we approach the text today, because it's sufficient in itself, okay? So Genesis chapter two, verse one, the first point that I'll give to you comes from verse one, and the first point is this, God finished creation. God finished creation creation. And I hope and pray that you've been confronted over the last several weeks with the majesty and the grandeur and the power of God in creation. I hope that since we've started Genesis, you haven't looked at one day the same. I have caught myself stopping and lingering longer, looking at the sunset. Have you noticed the moon the last couple nights? I mean, that is awesome. And God hung it in the sky on day four. But it's just incredible. And hopefully, as you've woken up over the last several weeks after studying Genesis, you have a greater appreciation for Elohim and the majesty of God that was on display in the first days of creation. Now, verse one of chapter two is summarizing for us what took place over the last six days. Let me first give you Genesis 1 verse 1 again. I'll remind you that it was a summary statement when God began to create the world. It said in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the first verse, on the first page of the Bible, we were introduced to Elohim, who is the almighty, all-powerful, all-sovereign God. It told us that there was a beginning, 
<laughs> and that God was in the beginning. And so our world has a very real start and history. It told us that God would bahra, that was the Hebrew word for create out of nothing or ex nihilo. God created out of nothing with zero ingredients because he was the only one there. And it tells us representing all that was about to be made that he bahra the heavens and the earth. Now you get to Genesis chapter two, verse one. Let's look at it together. And it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. Now, I just want you to hear Genesis 1, verse 1, and, and 2, verse 1, back to back for a moment. Listen, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. Isn't that amazing? It, it almost matches the parallelism and the repetition that we saw in the first six days of creation as we went through chapter one, every day of creation. And God said, let there be, it was so, it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And now here we are on the seventh day. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. God spoke and creation followed. So chapter two, verse one in your Bibles continues to put an exclamation point on the truth that what God purposes to do, God does. Not only does God do it, but God finishes what he starts. God doesn't begin a work and not see it through to completion. And if some of that language sounds familiar to you, it's because I am drawing from the New Testament language regarding your salvation. Isn't it awesome that God was creating at the beginning of time and he finished his creation? The New Testament proclaims that you are a new creation if you're in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 proclaims, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And Philippians chapter one, verse six says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Just as God started creation and finished creation. God has started a new creation in his people, in all of those who are in Christ, and he will be faithful to complete it. And God created the heavens and the earth, and God finished the heavens and the earth. Verse one, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. Hebrew for the word finished is the word kala, and it's in the passive verb, when it's paired with the phrase heaven and earth, Kala is telling us that the creation of the entire universe was at an ending point. On day one, God began to create. On day seven, God kalad because creation was complete, it was finished, and it was accomplished. And the text in your Bible, it throws in, and all the host of them. So what was above the earth, complete. The earth, planet earth, was now habitable and there was dry land there and, and space for vegetation and space for life and all the host of them represents that all that would fill space and all that would fill the sky and all that would fill the sea and all that would fill the land, everything is completed, all of it was finished. What is seen and what was unseen what was discovered and what had yet to be discovered above the earth and below the earth finished. Heavens and halos and horizons and hydrogen, Halley's Comet, hydrangeas, hostas, hawks, horned lark, hairy woodpeckers, haddocks, halibuts, horseflies, honeybees, horses, hedgehogs, hippopotamuses, hyenas, and humans. And that's just the letter H. All of it was done. God spoke it into existence. And thousands of years have passed since Genesis 2 verse 1 declared creation was finished. And yet we're still discovering new things today. There are black holes in the universe. Miles upon miles of ocean depths and trenches in the ocean. Life forms that many spend their lives seeking to discover, seeking to learn about because God's creation is vast 
And God's creation is wide and God's creation is elaborate and complex. But God and God alone started it. And Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 declares God and God alone finished it. And so the finality of the creation week is a work of God that we are meant to marvel at forever. Exalt him, Elohim, the creator of the ends of the earth. Now, number two that we pull from this text this morning is this. God rested on the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day. Look at verse two in your Bibles. It says, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. It's, a, it's really a, a remarkable part of the creation story. It's been interpreted many different ways. Uh, later, under the Mosaic law, we are given the Sabbath, which becomes law for God's people to observe every seven days. And the Sabbath has caused a lot of controversy over the years throughout Israel's history and even traditions and denominations today have split because of their understanding of the Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath, like I said, it's a buzzword because of the culture that we live in. We live kind of in a burnout culture here in America. We're running hard, earning, achieving, and striving. And there's absolutely a valuable challenge for us to find rhythms of rest in our everyday week. We'll touch on it in some application points at the end. But first, let's just get an understanding of what's happening in Genesis chapter 2. I want you to imagine for a moment that you just spent the week building an elaborate dream space at your home. Think about that. I don't know what it is. Uh, maybe you have something on your list that you want to create at your home. Maybe it's an elaborate, awesome tree cabin for your kids to hang out in. Uh, maybe it's a patio space in your backyard so that you can have people over and host them. Maybe it's a man cave for watching sports with your friends or like a, a, a reading room on your main level so you can invite girlfriends over and have tea and a book club, that sort of thing. So think about that. Uh, imagine you knew what you wanted and decided to put in the work all week long to get it done. So you buy supplies and you haul them on Monday, you cut the size and you drop the plans on Tuesday, you lay the foundation on Wednesday, you construct the space on Thursday, and then you paint and you decorate and you put the final touches on the space on Friday, just in time for the weekend. Now, what would be absolutely absurd is if you'd finished that project and then you never stepped foot into the finished product. It'd be absolutely ridiculous to think that you'd build a dream space at your home without any intention of enjoying it, relaxing in it, playing in it, maintaining it, and reaping the fruit of your labor. What you built would hopefully not be followed by inactivity, but hopefully it'd be followed by Children laughing and imagining and playing in your tree house. Hopefully it'd be family and friends coming over to hang on your patio or men watching Notre Dame beat Duke on Saturday night in your man cave. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and maybe it'd be, and maybe, I'm not even, a, I don't even know what I'm a fan of there, but just thought it, it fit. Spirit led. Um, and, 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 uh, or maybe you're having people over and you're drinking coffee in your reading room uh, in your main level. Now, here, here's the thing. That multiplied by galaxies and oceans and mountains and animals and effortlessness and absolute perfection, untainted by sin and shame, is what we see on day seven of creation. Elohim finished his creation, and Elohim enjoyed all that he had made because it was very good, and all the earth was full of his glory, and he was done creating. Verse 2 said, he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And it's important to understand this rest. We get the word rest in the verb form, sabbat, that later under the Mosaic law gives us the noun form. It makes it a noun, a day of the week, Shabbat or the Sabbath, which was the law of God's people to observe. But the emphasis on God's rest in Genesis chapter two, one through three is not around necessarily uh, the need to pause or the need to 
relax or the need to sharpen his saw for the next week that is to come. Uh, It was around his work being finished, him being done with what he was purposed to do. In verse one, we saw the heavens and the earth were finished. Verse two, seventh day, God finished. Verse two, God rested from the work that he had done. Verse three, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So God rested because he was done creating. So I don't know what you imagine when you think about God resting, but hopefully it's not an exhausted, sluggish God who's been depleted of his power, crawling onto his recliner to shut out the world and slip into a lazy, uninterrupted leisure. That's not God's rest. God doesn't lay on a recliner and need somebody to bring him a sandwich while he just falls into exhaustion and sleep. The prophet Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31, he said, have you not known and have you not heard that the Lord is an everlasting God and he's the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. He does not His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. Not older men, young men will fall exhausted, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is our God and this is who we were created to rest in. So there's a difference between you and there's a difference between God. You get tired, God does not. You grow weary, he never does. Your strength gets depleted, but God is omnipotent. Your creativity runs dry, but God is lightning quick and he's always on. You need sleep, God doesn't, but God rested on the seventh day, not from exhaustion, but rather it was him ceasing from his creativity and his activity. He stopped his work of creating. He abstained from more because there was no more that he needed to create, which speaks of his power. I mean, think about the complexities of the universe. Think about the depths. Think about everything that's moving and and rotating. and, And the laws of science had to have hung in balance as God rested The processes of growth and reproduction were in place. The first, second, and third laws of thermodynamics were in motion. The sun was perfectly placed 93 million miles away from the earth, and it rotated around the earth as the earth was spinning on a perfect axis, and God had all of that under control on day seven because God stopped creation because what he he created was complete. God didn't quit acting or working God just stopped his completed work. One commentator, Kenneth Matthews, he says this, the seventh day of creation is not an aversion to labor. It's not that you don't work on the seventh day. It's not that God wasn't working. God's always working. Seventh day of creation is not an aversion to labor, but the celebrative cessation of a completed work whereby he expresses his mastery over time by sanctifying it. God stopping shows his power in all of the universe. But not only that, he sanctified this day of rest for the rest of humanity and for us. So it leads to point number three from the text. God made the seventh day holy. God made the seventh day holy. Look at verse three in your Bibles. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, you'll remember last week as we looked at the Imago Dei, we saw God bless humanity in chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. God blessed human beings not only with value. Remember, they have intrinsic worth and value if you are created because you're created in the image and likeness of God. But he not only created them with value, he created them with functionality and a purpose. Big deal. But now we see God blessing the seventh day. I can understand why God would bless his most prized possessions, humanity. But what's up with God blessing a day? What's so special about a day? And and maybe you've heard 
some of this before. This is kind of like Bible nerd stuff. And I got geeked out on it a little bit on Friday, numbers in the Bible. But for instance, 12 seems to be like a number of authority that you see throughout scripture. So Jacob had 12 sons later in Genesis. And then we get 12 tribes of Israel and Jesus chose 12 disciples. And in heaven around the throne of the lamb, there are 12 thrones there. And the 12 are bowing down and throwing their crowns before the lamb. Even more repeated all throughout scripture, it's a Hebrew literary uh, 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 thing. Uh, even more repeated throughout scripture is the number seven. Seven represents a symbol of ancient perfection. Seven seems to show completion in God's economy. Seven is used more than 700 times all throughout the Bible. Jacob worked seven years for Laban so that he could marry his daughter. In the book of Revelation, you see seven early churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Peter asked Jesus, hey, when somebody offends me, should I, I, I forgive my brother seven times? And Jesus said, no, forgive him 70 times, seven. <laughs> and even later in, in the pagan world, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, uh, the number seven means totality, completion, and perfection. Now, here we are today, okay? Think about this, all these years later, here we are today and we operate within a seven-day week. Isn't that cool? And, and the seventh day is the end of our week. That's the name Saturday is what we call the seventh day or what the Bible would call the seventh day. And it's largely, Saturday is largely the day we're not doing what we do the other six days of the week. So you gotta, it's kind of fascinating, but how did we even get this seventh day week? And, and how did we get the rhythmic ending of the week that is called Saturday? And you can read lots of different things. Even pagan cultures have tried to do away with the seven day work week and it just doesn't work. It just keeps coming back to, for some reason, the universe is revolving and there's 365 days in a year and somehow this unlikely number seven has given us a seven day week and it just works. But could it be that on the first pages of the Bible, it shows us God creating a world and a universe that somehow revolves and makes sense around the unobvious number seven? Could it be that the common off day within our calendar week was blessed by God the first week? Could it be that Elohim is all that he says that he is, that he is all powerful, that he is all sovereign, that he is all knowing and that he was there in the beginning and after six days of creating, he rested on the seventh day? I say that it is. I say that God is that big, that God is that vast, that God is that in control. But just as God blessed man with value and purpose, God blessed and made the seventh day holy, not only because of its value, but because of the purpose that he was giving that day. By sanctifying the seventh day, God devoted it to himself as the creator. God designated a time when the creator and the creatures were in communal relationship. And as God stopped creating because creation was done, his rest served as a symbol of God the creator and man the creation together. Creation existed to worship the creator. All of creation moved in motion with the creator and human life lived and moved and found being in God alone. Now, it's interesting to note that the passage doesn't end here with there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. We saw that pattern throughout the other six days. There was evening, there was morning. Some have said, like, why didn't it say there was morning, then there was evening? And I think it's interesting that later when we get to the Mosaic law and the, the Israelite people have Shabbat and, and once a week they rest from all their work and they focus on God, it started evening to morning. It went from Friday evening and it went through Saturday. Kind of cool. They were building their plans, building their lives off of exactly what we see in the text but creation, it doesn't say it on day seven because creation was intended to enjoy a perpetual rest provided by God. Not a rest from work, but a rest in God. And our text today doesn't show man resting. It doesn't command man to rest or keep the seventh day because before there was sin, man lived in perpetual, eternal perfection. God didn't have to instruct Adam and Eve to worship him 
throughout the week because Adam was in step with his creator and Adam would do it. God didn't have to tell Adam and Eve to rest because they were formed into God's rest. They were placed into what God was celebrating on the seventh day. They were created into a world that God saw was very good. And so there was no sweat of the brow. There was no hard ground to till. There was no work grind or opposition. Adam indeed would work, but he wouldn't have to endure cursed work. And Eve would have babies, but her Having babies wouldn't be multiplied by pain that came through sin. And Adam and Eve would commune with God on the seventh day because that day was holy and they were holy because they were created in the image and the likeness of God. Now the text, it just closes repeating what we've seen. Verse three, the last sentence, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, what practically should we draw from God's rest and the holy seventh day? Let me remind you of the big idea that I gave you at the beginning of the sermon. It was true rest is found in God's finished work. God was resting because he was finished. And your rest is found only in God's finished work work. Adam and Eve are the only humans to have experienced this truth on the earth. Think about that. They knew fully the unadulterated, incorrupt Sabbath rest in communion with God. Had sin never entered the world, eternal rest in God as creator would still be happening. And the final product of God's creation was complete enjoyment in him for Adam and Eve. So now the question becomes, because of sin, what do we do with this holy day of rest? What does God desire concerning our holy rest? So let me give you four applications for holy rest as we kind of land the plane on this sermon. And I want this to be helpful to you. So so lean in here. These are the practical points that we pull out. Number one is this, revel in God's creation. Revel in God's creation. And ultimately, God blessing and consecrating day seven of creation was him setting aside a day of remembrance. Day seven of the week is a symbol to see and know that Elohim is creator. The Sabbath is a day to remember that Elohim is the creator of the ends of the earth. I was thinking about the Westminster Catechism statement, uh, uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I've been convicted by that statement in in my life uh, because I, I want to glorify God with my life. I want to worship God. I want to give all the glory to God. Sometimes I don't think I, I lean fully into this enjoying thing, like enjoying God forever. Uh, That's what it says the chief end of man is. You know, I think sometimes the circumstances of this life and the trials that we go through and we, we, we constantly, especially in our country, flood ourselves with information and we're probably carrying a lot more weight that we weren't necessarily to care, made to carry. And so we, we kind of plague our minds and our thoughts with lots of stuff that we can't control. And so your faith may feel like a grind. Your faith may feel like you're just trying to persevere and get through this rather than enjoying God. But the chief end of man is that you would glorify God and that you would enjoy him forever. Understand that that was happening in the garden for Adam and Eve, and it should still be happening today in all who have been restored by the cross of Jesus Christ. The the creation that is around us is a theater of God's redemption and power and we are meant to worship him. I mean, we're meant to see it on display before our eyes. Just as God rises the sun in the morning, his new mercies are there every single day. The sunrise is meant to remind you of the mercy of God. The breath in your lungs is meant to remind you that you are created in the image and likeness of God. Psalm 148, it's a great psalm. Let me just give you the part about humanity. It says, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. There's the phrase, heaven and earth. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, 2-1. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. Psalm 148, his majesty is over the earth and heavens. The, the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. So Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Or, or Psalm 113, 2 through 3, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So people of God, stop and notice. Take the time to slow down and see what God is doing. Take the time to stop and breathe and enjoy the creation that the good Lord has blessed you with and given you dominion over. Take a walk in the woods. Take a walk on the beach. Revel in God's grand creation and may it move you to worship him. Now, number two, applications for holy rest. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day. Now, in Exodus 20, if you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to turn there and read it to you. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. But God gives Moses the law on Mount Sinai, and number four of the moral Mosaic law was remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Let me read it to you. Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses is on Mount Sinai, and this is what it says. Number four of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day. So there, the verb rested becomes the noun, Shabbat. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Pretty awesome that... That time later, as God is speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, you see the confirmation of God creating the world in six days, resting on the seventh, and God's example is now extended to God's people for how they are to live. But we talked about the difference between you and God. Uh, God never grows weary, you do. You get tired, God never does. There's also another difference. God intentionally rested from his work, and often you don't. God intentionally rested from his work, and often you don't. God resting is an example to us, not to be bored or lazy one day of the week, but to regularly take time to stop doing what we always do. It's a pretty common thing to walk about the hallways even at church and say, hey, how are you doing? And the answer that often people give or I often give is, man, doing pretty good, really busy just super busy. Oh, I'm so busy. What has got you so busy? What's got us so busy? What idols have you running so hard in a direction that is not after the creator who is Elohim? What has got you so busy that you can't stop in, in the middle of your week and glorify God and enjoy God and learn about God and sit with God and pray to God and apply the things of God and talk about God and linger with God among family and friends. Just as the 10 commandments were given out of love so God's people could live in a relationship with him, the Sabbath day was to be kept holy because God wanted to make his people holy. The Sabbath was given so that we would be holy as he is holy and sin entered the world and God knew that everything in this world, this sinful world would be pulling us to work in our own efforts and so he set aside a day so that the people who would live in relationship with him would stop doing all of it and simply just lean into him as creator, would learn about him, would love him, would glorify him and enjoy him. And every week, Sabbath served as a reminder to God's people that he is Elohim and the creator who is the one true God. Now, here we are on the right side of the cross, new covenant people, the church has been born. So we don't remember the Sabbath and we don't keep the Sabbath the same day that God's people did. 
So we have to, we have to ask, what do we do with remembering the Sabbath? It's, it's an important thing. Interesting, when you get to the New Testament, every commandment, nine commandments are repeated in the New Testament. The one that you don't see repeated or told to us to do is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Not in the New Testament. It talks about the Sabbath, but we look to Jesus as to how we are to deal with the Sabbath. And how did Jesus deal with the Sabbath? How did Jesus treat the Sabbath? However he wanted to. <laughs> he often intentionally broke the Sabbath to prove a point to the puffed up prideful Pharisees who had made it about what they were doing to earn a right standing with God. The Sabbath became this weighty thing that they were heaping on, on the people of God in shame. And Jesus comes along and he starts to heal on the Sabbath and his disciples were eating on the Sabbath. And Jesus tells a man to pick up his bed and walk, which was definitely against the law on the Sabbath. And that wasn't happenstance. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. And in Mark chapter two, verse 27 and 28, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, which is exactly what human beings like to do. They like to flip it around, right? Creation was not meant to be, be worship. Creation is meant to worship God. Everything is created for God. So the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So does it mean that Jesus did away with rest for us? No. But just like Jesus was a better Adam and just like Jesus was a better Moses, Jesus is a far better Sabbath. Jesus is a far better Sabbath. And so rather than finding your hope and your rest in a day, Jesus came that you might find your rest in him and him alone. That leads us to the third application of our text today. And it's this, run to Jesus daily. Believer, run to Jesus daily. You can do it every single day. Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what the law does? The law weighs us down because the law shows us that we can't keep it, that we couldn't keep it on our best day. But Jesus comes, he says, hey, get in the yoke with me. A yoke is kind of a heavy thing unless you're standing beside Jesus and he's doing all the work for you. And when you get in the yoke beside Jesus, it means that you're going through this life beside him, like him. You're being transformed to be like Jesus. And Jesus is doing all the heavy lifting because he alone is perfect and he alone can save your soul. You can find Sabbath rest every day with your Bible open as you look to Jesus. In John 15, five, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus came to fulfill the burden of the law, to become the punishment for your sin, to pay the wages of sin that is death for you and to become the only way to eternal rest as God intended in the garden. And then he proclaims, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the father. No one gets the rest that is in the father except through me. The seventh day can still be a day to enjoy God as creator. I hope when you get to Saturday or whatever day you have off in the week, if you have an off day, and some of us aren't fortunate enough to have that in our world, but hopefully you have a time and a day where you just stop doing all the other things and you press into the goodness of Jesus. You lean in to Jesus. You open your Bible and you commune with the God of glory. Sabbath is meant to be a day where we worship him as creator, but the church, Jesus, he gave us the Lord's day you see after this that the people of God begin to meet on not the seventh day, but the first day of the week. That's what we're doing here today. On the first day of the week, we get the Lord's day. And on the Lord's day, we worship Jesus as a redeemer. The Sabbath is God as creator. The Lord's day is Jesus is a redeemer. Sin entered the world and, and marred the rest of God. But Jesus came to restore so that we could find eternal rest in him. That leads us to the fourth application. Rely solely on God's finished work. 
Rely solely on God's finished work. On day seven of creation, God stopped creating and rested. On the Sabbath, God's people stopped working to rest in their creator. And get this, today the gospel demands that you stop. The gospel demands that you stop striving to earn God's favor, that you stop working to earn your salvation, that you stop boasting in your accomplishments, and that you stop trying to achieve God's love. The gospel demands that each of us rely solely on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Just as creation was finished, you who are in Christ are a new creation, and that is a sealed deal with the Holy Spirit. He is the guarantee of getting you to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So rest in the finished work of Christ. Rest in Christ alone. I'll just close by directing you to Hebrews chapter 4. Just let me read to you. Hebrews chapter 4 says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. And then you jump down to, to verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 4 and it says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then... There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his own works as God did from his. Just as God rested from his works, we gotta rest from ours. And, and for the Israelite people who have to kind of unlearn a lot of things in the book of Hebrews, they were trying to earn God's future rest or in, in, in what they were doing and what they could bring to the table. And, and the reality is the gospel proclaims that you have nothing that you can bring. All you can give is your heart, which is dirty and tainted by sin. But Jesus is a redeemer and Jesus restores. So let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. How can you continue onward? How can you be obedient? It, it, it is obedience. <laughs> you will Earn God's rest when you rely fully on the grace that has been extended to you and the mercy that came with Jesus dying on a cross. And when you give up control, you can then trust and obey that he is Elohim and that he is Redeemer and that his Holy Spirit will carry you forward. And Hebrews 4 goes on, for the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You want to rest in God? Then open your Bible every day. Open your Bible each week. Dig deep in the Word of God, the love letter of God, and you'll find Him. Come on, stand to your feet, and let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word and to seek you. And we thank you that you told us that if we seek you, we will find you. If we knock, the door will be open. So Lord, I pray for every person here who's uh, striving in their own efforts and strength. I pray for those who are just worn out and weary. I pray for those who feel like they're gonna fall exhausted. And God, I pray that they would put their hope in Jesus alone. I pray that today you would fill them up and fuel them up. I pray that this would send them into a week where they don't try to find their rest. Even in creation, they try to find their rest in God. Lord, we could have the perfect rhythmic, regimented week and routine and still miss the point of God's rest.
Help us to understand that our rest comes through the gospel alone, through, through recognizing that you are creator God and that we are sinful and fallen and desperately in need of a savior. But we recognize that Jesus is that Lord and savior. And so we repent and we believe. Would you help us to throw ourselves at the cross? Would you help us to throw ourselves on our face before the feet of almighty Jesus and call him Lord? And would that lead us into the eternal rest of God? May we persevere. Severe. May we not give up. And would you encourage us today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.